Good morning, everybody. We are going to do some reading. (laughs) It's my favorite thing to do. It's the hardest thing to do. Reading and understanding. But uh, it was a perfect song to go with what we're going to read about. And let me tell you about my Jesus. So... Let's go, let's go tell people about him. And to do that, we're going to go into 1 Kings. Oh, my stomach's full. <laughs> yeah. All right. First Kings, chapter seventeen, verse eight. It it begins the story of a very inspirational character from the Bible, and. You know, we always talk about Elijah as just being amazing and not the disobedient kind of little brat that he was. But in this portion right here, he included God and everything. He took God with him. So that's what we're going to read. So it says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath, As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for you, for yourself and your son, for this is what the Lord The God of Israel says, There will always be flour and olive oil left in your container until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised Through Elijah. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse, 
and finally he died. Then she said to Elijah, O man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? But Elijah replied, Give me your son. And he took the child's body from her arms, carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying, and laid the body on his bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, why have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? And he stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord. O Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. It's kind of an interesting story, right? Like, if only they had Google. Like, a random person shows up, and unless they're wearing an Amazon vest, FedEx, or UPS, you guys aren't going to let them anywhere near your home. And this guy is a stranger. And he walks up and says, I'm hungry. Can you feed me? She says, well, that's funny. I only have one bite left, and that was for me and my son. But yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give it to you. There was so much faith going on. I'm guessing she had been praying because God sent him directly to her. And then Elijah, at every moment, stops and asks God, and God answers him immediately. This is, very, this is a very interesting story in that sense that he ends up in situations where he needs to God, but he was constantly talking to God, so there's this relationship where God's answering him and working through him and moving through him. Now let's go to Acts. This is a story of Paul. And Paul is out making everybody angry. All right. Acts 18, verse 1 through 17. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers, just as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue, trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. And after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, Your blood is upon your own heels. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. Then he left and went to the home of Titus Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. 
Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for a, the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. But when Gallio became governor of Achaia, some Jews rose up together against Paul and brought him before the governor for judgment. They accused Paul of persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our law. But just as Paul started to make his defense, Gallio turned to Paul's accusers and said, Listen, you Jews, if this were a case involving some wrongdoing or a serious crime, I would have a reason to accept your case. But since it is merely a question of words and names in your Jewish law, take care of it yourselves. I refuse to judge such matters. And, the, and he threw them out of the courtroom. The crowd then grabbed Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him right there in the courtroom, but Gallio paid no attention. God bless you. So the message, take God with you. Everywhere you go, every decision you make, include him in your life. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And all the good things and all the bad things. So many times we don't want to burden God with our little problems. Imagine if your relationship with God was how you see it, or was not how you see it, but how God actually intends for it to be. He expects it to be an actual relationship. But instead, he's treated like a genie. Hey God, can you help me? I really messed up and got myself into a really bad bind. Now I need you. I need a miracle to save me from what I did. Or to save you from the sin that you keep committing. We don't want God to be watching us when we are at our worst. But we want him to be watching us, taking selfies and when we're doing something good, like, hey, did you get that one? I did something good. I gave money to a homeless person. I was helping one of yours, like it says. But what happens when you drive away from a homeless person? What about when we do evil? What do we say then? Well, I hope he was answering somebody else's prayer and like healing cancer or something and wasn't over here paying attention to me. See, we, we pretend that we can direct when God sees us, when he helps us, But that's not what Elijah did, and that's not what he told Paul to do. He told Paul, I am with you. So take God with you. It's a relationship. Take him to the grocery store with you. 
I guarantee if you ask God whether or not you should buy 1% or 2% milk, by the time you get up to the check stand and something really happens and you find somebody who doesn't have enough money and God's like, hey, remember that extra 20? It's for this moment. If you are always talking to God, he's going to be there. You're going to be in a relationship with him where you will know the Holy Spirit is there to help you. Include him in your life. Don't turn your back on him. This book is full of people who have turned their back on him. And now we don't have enough fear of the Lord to not do that. So many churches have turned their back on Scripture, on God, because there isn't a fear of what he might actually do. Now we're going to go read a prayer that says exactly that. Psalms 31. Oh, it's a baby. I've been spending a lot of time in Psalms recently. I don't know why. Psalm 31, a psalm of David. O Lord, O Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me, for you do what is right. Turn your ear to listen to me. Rescue me quickly. Be my rock of protection, a fortress where I will be safe. You are my rock and my fortress. For the honor of your name, lead me out of this danger. Pull me from the trap my enemies set for me. For I find protection in you alone. I entrust my spirit into your hand. Rescue me, Lord, for you are a faithful God. I hate those who worship worthless idols. I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your unfailing love, for you have seen my troubles. And you care about the anguish of my soul. You have not handed me over to my enemies, but have set me in a safe place. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am in distress. Tears blur my eyes. My body and soul are withering away. I am dying from grief. My years are shortened by sadness. Sin has drained my strength. I am wasting away from within. I am scorned by all my enemies and despised by my neighbors. Even my friends are afraid to come near me. When they see me on the street, they run the other way. I am ignored as if I were dead, as if I were a broken pot. I have heard the many rumors about me, and I am surrounded by terror. My enemies conspire against me, plotting to take my life. But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying, You are my God. My future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. Let your favor shine on your servant in your unfailing love. Rescue me. Don't let me be disgraced. Don't let me be disgraced, O Lord, for I call out to you for help. Let the wicked be disgraced. Let them lie silent in the grave. Silence their lying lips, those proud and arrogant lips that accuse the godly. How great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. You hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against them. You shelter them in your presence, 
far from accusing tongues. Praise the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his unfailing love. He kept me safe when my city was under attack. In panic, I cried out, I am cut off from the Lord, but you heard my cry for mercy and answered my call for help. Love the Lord, all you godly ones, for the Lord protects those who are loyal to him. But he harshly punishes the arrogant. So be strong and courageous, all you who put your hope in the Lord. There's two groups. Which one do you want to be a part of? When I read this, A phrase came to mind. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer is used in war. But it's misused in the way we understand it. See, if you're going to go fight somebody, you're going to war, you don't want to divide your forces. You actually want to divide their forces. You want them to be divided so that later you can conquer them. See, the world wants to shut you down because they really ultimately want to shut God down, but they can't. The world can't shut God down. But the world can make you fear for your life. They can threaten you with taking away your business license. They can threaten you with shutting down your church, throwing your pastor in jail if you don't follow their rules. They can threaten you with harming you. Cutting your water off, cutting your electricity off. The world wants you to worship the world and not God. Because if it can divide you from God, then it can conquer you. If you stand with God and only God, they can't touch you. We have a superpower. That's our salvation. You can do anything you want to my body. Shoot, I want to go home. Romans. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? 
as the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No one, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me tell you about my Jesus. That was the perfect song. We have two examples that I read. Elijah, Paul. Doing things that probably made them uncomfortable. But following God and having God there with them. Having them... and See, God's always there. We're the ones that choose to turn our back on Him. I remember when I was driving and I didn't even know God and I cried out to Him and He was there. And once you are with God, then who can be against you? And as the world tries to separate you from Him, they can't, because guess what? You were just talking to Him about everything. Include Him in everything. Have a relationship. If we are the bride and He is the bridegroom, then treat Him that way. Include Him in everything. Ask Him what His opinion is. Not that you wives ask your husbands, but you should. I was going to say something that's just going to open up a can of worms. I guess since I attack the women, I'll attack the men. Men, when you're asked a question, give an answer. Don't just say, that's fine. I like to use both hands to, to shoot, so. These four study points, I hope they connect for you. You know, we look at Elijah and we look at Paul as being so faithful, but they had to be reminded by God. But these are two very good examples of them crying out and him giving an immediate answer. There was a pastor talking about Christians are so worried about doing and doing and doing that they start volunteering for this because I got to do, I got to be out there seeing, doing God's work. (laughs) Well, you know that sitting and studying 
and not speaking is doing something? You know, saying we don't understand the Bible and not taking an hour a day studying, meditating, we're not even giving it an attempt. We all live busy lives. And we don't have time for much. But when football season comes around, all of a sudden we have time to watch 10 hours of TV. I'm, I'm one. <laughs> I, I enjoy watching football. I'm not a fanatic, but I do enjoy watching sports a lot. God wants to be in a relationship with you. God wants to be able to use you. And you want to be used by God. You want God to be present in your life. Just even that widow was like, oh, we have bread. Oh, you really are a man of God. And then... Her, she and her son were about to go die, and then when he actually died, she's like, it's your fault! <laughs> it's such a weird story. <laughs> but it is so revealing of God's presence in Elijah's life and the work that he was able to do through Elijah because of Elijah's faith and willingness to be weird and awkward. I can't imagine saying, can I have your last sandwich? I know you said if you don't eat this, you're going to die, but can I have it? <laughs> it takes a lot of faith. But he was being faithful, and he listened and ended up being a blessing. Nothing can separate you from God. Unless you decide to separate yourself. There's going to be lots of attempts. But stay close to your God. Take him everywhere with you. Somebody said, imagine that God is over your shoulder watching you as you scroll. Some of the things may not be so funny anymore. Somebody else said, if you read Corinthians 13, and it says everything that love is, and this is the love that we're supposed to do, if you interject your name, are you kind? Are you not jealous? And you put your name in there. How many times do you fall short? Including God, using the word to, to change your life, to walk closer with God is a good thing. Getting rid of godly things to adopt worldly things, just putting a wedge between you and God. All right, let's pray. Father God Almighty, we give thanks and praise, Lord, for this day. For the people inside this building, Lord, I ask that you would bless them. I ask that you would give them courage to get to know you better, courage and strength to raise Christian families, to lead our children to you, not to an image of what a Christian is, but to an image of God. Lord, I ask for 
opportunities to read your word and that those opportunities would be taken. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, which illuminates this word and helps us understand. Bless us, guide us, give us strength, courage, and peace and joy, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.